Sitting back here reminds me of a cute story from my first church. And I'll sort of use this to segue into my comments. Um, there was a larger pulpit at my first church, and the pastor sat next behind that pulpit in a chair that had been there for decades. Timmy Wright was about three months old when I went to the first church. It was a town of 250 people, 10 miles from a gallon of gas and a loaf of bread. And as Timmy grew, he was maybe two years old, it was a Sunday morning, and I was sitting in that throne behind the pulpit, and I had previously been standing there and then sat down, and he turned to his mother and said, where did God go? <laughs> About a year later, I had a, my, my son had a St. Louis Cardinal cap. It was a little one for little babies. He had outgrown it. So uh, Diane Wagner had had a child. Philip was his name. And we gave him that hat to wear which is important because this is a church right outside of Kansas City. I moved there in 1988, and if you're a baseball fan, you know that the single most embarrassing moment in Major League history happened in 1985 when Don Dankinger, the umpire, blew a call and lost the World Series for the St. Louis Cardinals. <laughs> not, not that I'm holding any grudges. <laughs> So when I gave that hat to this child and he wore it, it was like a victory for me. And a couple of weeks go by and Diane comes up and says, I wish to God you'd never given him that hat. <laughs> I thought this had to do with the rivalry. She said, I go to put him in bed, in bed at night and take that off and he won't take it off and puts it on. I put him in the bathtub, I take that and he won't take it off and puts it on. And I finally said, Philip, you can't wear that. And he said, but Mama. Jesus gave that to me. <laughs> All of that is prelude for. I am still trying to wrap my head around myself as general minister and president. Although, if I saw myself through the lens of Timmy Wright or Philip Wagner, this shouldn't come as a surprise to me. <laughs> I'm still that pastor of a church in a town of 250 people. Uh, I'm still Janice, Jeff, Jerry, Jim, Joe, and Jay's brother. This whole general minister and president thing is, is kind of a, it's surreal to me. And there was a moment when I was still trying to figure out what this was that I was doing. When I was in the National Cathedral, Jim and I were there together on a night celebrating the, not just the Pope's visit to America, but especially his call to climate care. La Dante Si had just come out. And we were celebrating that at the National Cathedral. And, and I was there invited to be a speaker on the dais with some pretty heavy hitters. And we're over on the side of the front altar getting our instructions. And I'm standing next to Sheldon Whitehouse, a name you may recognize. <laughs> right. A senator from Rhode Island. And next to him is the ambassador from South Africa. And we're about to go up and sit on stage next to each other, between these two people. And at one point, sitting on stage, I'm literally singing to myself that old Sesame Street song. One of these things doesn't go on. <laughs> that really happened. <laughs> but while we're getting ready, I wanted to go up and meet Sheldon. I didn't know what the protocols were. How do you greet a senator? Are there secret service people you have to go through? Uh, do you have to speak to an aide or an advocate? Um, are there honorifics that need to be? And I'm doing all of this, and he comes over and introduces himself to me, and with a kind of awkwardness.
this that reflects he was as nervous beating me as I was beating him. And he started telling me about his local UCC church and his pastor and how proud he was of both of them. And about halfway through the evening, it dawned on me, this isn't about John Dorhauer. This is about the general minister and president of one of the most powerful agents of social transformation this country's ever known. Amen. The United Amen. Church of And when an event was being planned at the National Cathedral to give voice to those who had something to say about climate change, there was no way the United Church of Christ's voice was going to be absent from that discussion. And so it is that I have been saying everywhere I go, the Holy Spirit envisions a future in which we matter. And we can read all of the data and statistics we want about church membership, about contributions shrinking, and like we've been doing for the last two or three decades, wring our hands with anxiety and assume that means that our demise is on the horizon. And that our diminished capacity and relevance is the narrative of our future. But I don't believe that for a second. The Holy Spirit envisions a future in which we matter. We have been, as I said, one of the greatest agents for social transformation this world has ever known. We're not going to stop being that, nor will the Holy Spirit stop investing in a people that committed to social transformation and the creation of a beloved community and the installation and ushering in of God's vision of shalom. And I'm going to talk about two things that set the United Church of Christ apart, which the Holy Spirit, who is the lifeblood of the church, is fully aware of, from for which reason the Spirit will continue to invest in our health and vitality. And then I'm going to talk about a couple of commitments in this relationship with God's Holy Spirit that we need to make in order to demonstrate our continued hope, passion for, and belief in a gospel that when proclaimed faithfully changes lives and changes the world. Mm -hmm. So, the two things that set us apart, and I want this to be heard in this context. Michael Kinnaman, uh, former General Secretary for the National Council of Churches, was once asked while serving his term, why do we even have the nominations? So, after all, we're moving into a post-denominational world. And Michael Kinnaman's response was, and this is brilliant, the nominations exist in order to perpetuate an aspect of the gospel that but for them would be in danger of diminishment or extinction. Just think about that for a moment. There are a lot of things the United Church of Christ does that every one of our ecumenical partners does. We can talk about worship. We can talk about educating our clergy. We can talk about confirmation. We can talk about the sacraments. We can talk about evangelism. We can talk about stewardship. We all do that, and we all do it well. And if all we do as a denomination is what every one of our ecumenical partners do, then what is our reason for being? What is it that sets us apart? What is it that we are willing to commit ourselves to that but for us means that this aspect of the gospel is in danger of diminishment or extinction? And there are two things, and I'm going to argue that those two things and the need for each of them is not going to disappear on the horizon, nor is our commitment to them going to disappear. And so what we're talking about here in the end is organizational change that makes the institution as it's currently organized feel a bit threatened, but does not diminish the gospel's capacity to continue to be proclaimed faithfully and in the faithful proclamation thereof continue to change lives and change the world. The first of those two commitments is actually on this ring that I wear. This is a gift given to me 
by the Lay Academy of the Southwest Conference. My, one of my last weekends in a conference, I taught at the Lay Academy, and they gave this beautiful gift to me. It's the silver ring with the, the logo and the motto of the United Church of Christ inscribed around the outside of it. And it reads that they may all be one. Our commitment to unifying the body is different than that of our ecumenical partners who have a fervor themselves for unity. But as the 20th century moved and there was this call from the World and National Council of Churches to bring the body together, some of us took that so seriously that we gave up our own denominational identity in order to not just create a unity, but to say to the world that without this unity, the gospel has little hope of surviving. And in some of the words written in preparation for that unity, and I think actually spoken at the Unified Synod in 1957 in Cleveland, were the words that we will continue to do all required of us to keep the gospel alive, including, if need be, to die. Meaning, if we need to dissolve this union in order to form another one, we will. These are our natural impulses. This is who we are in our birth narrative. Tell us the story of a community, of communities of folk willing to come together for the sake of a gospel that without such passion for unity cannot be proclaimed faithfully and fully. There is no question, I'm going to say two things about this passion for unity. The first is, there is no question that without this drive to bring diverse communities together, without that, human community as we know it will soon dissolve. North Korea is already testing nuclear weapons. And the Middle East is an amalgam of powers ready to blow each other off the map. And the rhetoric now globally between Christian community and Muslim community has us all sitting on the edge of our seats, wondering what's next. And if the United Church of Christ can't become a partner in a global movement committed to unity, then human community as we know it has little hope of surviving. And there's no way that the Holy Spirit is going to stop investing in a community of people this clearly committed to building unity across divisions that threaten to tear us apart. The second thing I want to say about this call to unity. It was a bold thing that we did in 1957 in forming a union of ecumenical partners. But here it is 2016 and it's dawning on us that an ecumenical ask is too small a task. That the call to unify human community is much bigger than finding those of like mind of, of faith. That this is now at least an interreligious interfaith ask, and probably even bigger than that. And so Karen Georgia Thompson now no longer your ecumenical officer of, in the United Church of Christ, but your ecumenical and interfaith officer is organizing multiple belonging conversations that are now global. Multiple belongings is a little different than the interfaith dialogues that many of us have been a part of, in that it emerged out of a pastoral concern. Not just UCC pastors and not just Christian clergy, but clergy of all interfaith stripes find within their house of worship those on a spiritual journey who are in partnership or marriage with somebody on a very different spiritual journey. And so when mom is Jewish and dad is Christian, how do you baptize in such a way that that child doesn't go home and think less of his mother. 
That's the multiple belonging conversation that Karen Georgia Thompson, your ecumenical and interfaith officer, is organizing on behalf of the United Church of Christ, living out its call to fulfill Christ's dying prayer that they may all be one, and seeing beyond just the ecumenical boundaries that have sort of drawn our interests. In addition to that, even before the time of my election, uh, I was meeting with Peter Morales, president of the Unitarians, Rick Jacobs, president of the Union of Reformed Jews, and various representatives from the Islamic Society of North America, ISLAM. And we are continuing those dialogues. We meet once a month. And the question put to us is, given the core values that we share with one another and the movement for social transformation that we're each a part of, how do we recreate our landscape in such a way that we are common partners on the playing field together? And so this is the vision and mission of your United Church of Christ, living out its promise and commitment and passion for a unity that Christ himself not only envisioned, but knew that the gospel would be compromised without, that they may all be one. The second imperative for the United Church of Christ and the second aspect of the gospel that is in fact in danger of diminishment or extinction, but for our commitment to it, is this offer of an extravagant welcome. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're welcome here. Once again, we are not the only players in an ecumenical landscape who have a passion for an extravagant welcome. And all of our ecumenical partners will admit that we live that out with the kind of commitment that is unique. <coughs> And there is no doubt in my mind that but for the United Church of Christ's clear commitment to that proclamation, it is in fact a danger of diminishment or extinction. And every time this question gets brought up in our communion partners, it's an open contest. And it may or may not carry the day. And but for us, this aspect of the gospel is in danger of diminishment or extinction. So, the question left for the Holy Spirit is, is this an aspect of the gospel worth saving? <laughs> yeah, it is. Now, 10 years ago, almost 11 now, the United Church of Christ launched its initial still speaking campaign. And that campaign was the brilliant design of Michael Jordan, who worked for a uh, Madison Avenue marketing firm now has his own company and he's working with us uh, to test what does the still speaking 2.0 version look like. And we're within weeks of sending toolkits out to every local church, enabling you to partner with us in telling this story of an extravagant welcome. And when Michael started working with the denomination to develop that campaign, and I'm arguing it is the single most galvanizing moment in the history of the United Church of Christ. That brought us together in ways that nothing before had. And 10 years later, we're still using the language of that campaign. It just rolls so easily off of our tongues. Never place a period where God has placed a comma, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're welcome here. And one of the things that Michael Jordan asked is, what edge do you want to walk over? What new territory do you want to claim as a body of Christ? And we said, among many things, but the one that we said most clearly was we want to declare rights for the LGBT community as an act of faith, not in spite of what Scripture teaches us, but precisely because of what Scripture teaches us. It is the faithful thing to do. And we knew that we were going to take hits for it. So we walked into that space well ahead of any of our ecumenical partners. And for 10 years or more, we've been preaching that aspect of the gospel unceasingly and unapologetically. 
And it's no coincidence that within 10 years of opening that campaign, walking into that space and crossing that boundary, every state in the country is now a marriage equality state. This is what we make happen when we preach the gospel unceasingly. Michael Jordan, in helping us craft Still Speaking 2.0, is asking the question, what's the new edge you want to walk into? We're testing a couple of ideas, which is why these toolkits we're sending out to you are going to be so important. You're going to help us learn what the new territory is. The, the couple of ideas that we're playing with right now are the interfaith notion that the United Church of Christ will become a leader in an interfaith movement that brings communities of faith together in common purpose and cause. And we've already been living this out. So right before Christmas when word came to us that there were going to be neo-Nazi and right-wing demonstrations in front of temples and mosques around the country, your United Church of Christ issued a letter declaring its support for our Muslim brothers and sisters and calling for clergy in every setting of the United Church of Christ to either communicate to their Muslim neighbors our solidarity or to be present in front of their place of worship to create safe space. A couple of things that came as a result of that. High Ridge, Missouri is rural Missouri. It's everything you think of when you think of rural Missouri. White, redneck, hillbilly, central Missouri. I can say that because I come from that part of the world. These are my people. I know them well. Ten years ago, they called a black Jamaican pastor. That's another story. It's a great story, but we won't tell that story now. We're going to fast forward ten years after they called him, and it's a Sunday morning. It's the Sunday after that letter was circulated. Worship had been going on for 10 minutes when the back door of the church opens up and in walks a Muslim family. Father, mother, two kids. I'm trying to imagine the courage in this climate it took in that community to open those doors after worship had already started. To walk up the aisle in the middle of worship interrupt it and say to the pastor in the pulpit, may we speak. Wow. He had enough good instincts to say yes. And he said something like, who is this United Church of Christ? We have never, never heard anything from a Christian denomination that showed such clear support. And all we want to say to you is thank you. And then they stayed for fellowship and lunch afterwards. Before the, they're leaving, they had arranged for visits with members of the church, shared meals in each other's homes. And a week ago, when I completed my installation tour in Seattle, Rima Kadri, representative of the Islamic Society of North America and their regional offices in the Pacific Northwest was there. And she greeted me with tears in her eyes and cited for me all of the things that she knew that I and the United Church of Christ had done to declare their support for the Muslim faith. She knew everything. And then she had been invited to bring greetings with my installation. I was supposed to give the benediction. I walked over to her, sort of inspired to do this halfway through the service. And I said, would you please offer the benediction? And so your general minister and president at the close of his installation service asked a woman of the Muslim faith to deliver the benediction. Now, she did that beautifully. I ended up leaving the service right there. I stayed for the reception. I didn't get to speak to her afterwards. But one of the members of the church was there and greeted her. And once again, she had tears in her eyes. She didn't know such a place existed. 
And the Pacific Northwest is part of a year-long campaign of the United Church of Christ to lift up our voice in bold public witness. In June, is going to call members of their churches to join their Muslim brothers and sisters in faith to participate in the 30-day fast of Ramadan in solidarity with. And as the fast closes after 30 days, with the feast of celebration breaking the fast, those Muslim brothers and sisters are going to invite those who participated in the fast to celebrate a table with them. And we're going to have a press conference before it starts and after it starts. Because when you read the papers, we are taught that Muslims and Christians hate each other and are about to tear the globe apart with their common hatred. And it's time for us to craft a different narrative. This is the United Church of Christ living out the gospel every day. We matter. And we're going to figure out what post-modernity is doing to change how we preach the gospel and organize ourselves. But the relevance of our proclamation and our commitment to aspects of the gospel that but for us are in danger of diminishment or extinction is not going to disappear. And the Holy Spirit knows that. I wrote the book, Beyond Resistance, knowing that this isn't the first time the body of Christ has been asked to change how it preaches the gospel. And not so much change the content of our proclamation as to remind ourselves that circumstances have sort of changed our proclamation of the gospel and we need to get back to those roots. This has happened a number of times throughout our history. The last time it happened, an entire continent went to war with one another for 100 to 150 years trying to sort it out. Now, I don't know that we're going to go to war with one another this time around, but I've been hearing the institutional church speak about the emerging church as if it's the cause of or a threat to our diminished relevance and capacity. And it isn't. There are things happening in our institutional world that have us anxious and a little afraid. But this is about the gospel and the faithful proclamation thereof. And we have partners who are willing to proclaim that gospel as faithfully as we are. And the question put to us is, what does an embrace of that, an alliance with those partners look like? We don't have to sacrifice who we are or what we do. But it's time we start building partnerships with those who are committed to the same cause as we are. Namely, the restoration of Shalom, the creation of the beloved community, and the establishment of the common good. And so, we're, we're living through a time of enormous change. I think it's my responsibility as general minister in this time to prepare the institutional church, not just the United Church of Christ's investment in that institutional expression, to embrace what's coming as the movement of the Holy Spirit working out the gospel in our time. And we are and will continue to be significant players in the proclamation of a gospel that changes lives. One more story, and then I think we've got, yeah, we've got some time for questions. One of the, my proudest moments happened last October when we liturgically enacted a full communion relationship that we established by vote at our General Synod with the United Church of Canada, and which shortly after our General Synod, they did at their national gathering. And so it was that after our board meeting in October, a busload of us went up to uh, Niagara Falls on the Canadian side and celebrated that evening in worship with our uh, brothers and sisters in faith in the United Church of Canada. David Gajewski, conference minister from New York, had emailed me ahead of time and said, we're going to bring a group of youth with us from upstate New York. They'd love just a moment with you if you could afford it that evening. And I said, of course. So we do this beautiful service. We're in the fellowship hall, just at the 
the reception having a grand time, and David comes up and he says, I've got the youth in a room down the hall. Would you come and visit with them? Absolutely. So I walk down the hallway, and there are about 20 youth in there, and I walk in, and they're all giddy. I still can't get used to that. They're all giddy. They want selfies with the president. There's one 13-year-old young woman, and she notices that I'm wearing a rainbow comma, right? And she just lights up when she sees it. And so I take off the rainbow comma and I hand it to her. And she just can't believe it. She says, I, I can't take that from you. And I smiled and said, I think I know where I could get another one. <laughs> <laughs> so she took it and she's putting it on. And I thought I'd tease her just a little more. I said, now, my mom gave that to me on her deathbed. <laughs> And we all laughed. <laughs> and she put it on, and I just noticed this visible change came over her. And I was trying to interpret that through whatever lens of experience I had, and I thought, I can't imagine that 13 years old, a general minister and president of the United Church of Christ is that big a deal in her world. And it turns out it wasn't. <laughs> uh, a week later, I got an email from the youth director saying, let me tell you the back story. She was not a member of the youth group. <laughs> she didn't go to that church. She didn't go to any church. But one of her friends was coming and just asked her if she'd like to go on this trip. And she didn't have anything else happening on Saturday night. <laughs> and two weeks before that, she had come out to her parents. She didn't think there was a church for her. So here she is on this trip. She knows nothing about the United Church of Christ. Jordan Cantwell, my equivalent in the United Church of Christ, is there with her wife. And here's this, these two presidents standing side by side, one an out open married lesbian. And here's this young woman sitting, thinking, what is this? <laughs> and then an hour later, the general minister and president walks in with a rainbow comma, and she lights up, and he gives it to her. So two months roll by, it's a couple weeks before Christmas, and I get another email. Guess who's now a member of that church? <laughs> with her family, and about five other families that they brought with them. This is the United Church of Christ. Our faithful proclamation of the gospel and aspects of the gospel that both for us are in danger of diminishment or extinction change lives. We do this every day. And so the Holy Spirit envisions a future in which we matter. Let's not doubt that. Let's be about the work of proclaiming the gospel. Amen. Amen. Amen.